Cut a J. Thank you. 
the call to worship, which is found in our worship guides. All who are righteous shout with joy to our God. Let us sing a new song. Praise God and give thanks with organs, with guitars, with all kinds of instruments. Play your best with joy. Because our Creator's word is right, and everything God does is done for our good. Let your faithful love surround us, O God. Please pray with me. O holy God, we know the beauty of this June day, and we are grateful. We experience the warmthness of the sunshine and the beautiful melody of the birds singing, and we are grateful. We share the love of family and friends on this Father's Day and the family and friendship that is our church. And we are grateful. Through the grace of Jesus Christ, we know the opportunity to bring new selves to this new day that we might worship with our community in joy and thanksgiving and be filled with the good news we would offer everyone. <coughs> For all of these things, we are deeply grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first hymn of praise is hymn number 502, <coughs> Lord, speak to me that I may speak. Please stand, and you will have to take your hymnal out today, since we don't have the words on the screen. But please stand and sing together, hymn number 502. <laughs> Anyway, so that's one of my favorite photos of my, my 
my son and I. So one of the things that I remember most about my dad was my dad, when my dad was getting killed, he asked me to promise and said that I would take care of my mom. And my mom is still with us. Have you ever made a promise to anybody? Yeah. yeah. Do you remember what the word was? No? No? What about you, sir? No? No, you don't tell me. Don't tell me. No, okay. All right, so, <clears throat> well, have you ever made a promise and broken that promise? It's okay, yeah. It's okay, yeah. Come on. Anyway, maybe it's not the deal. Yeah? Okay. How did, how did that make you feel? Not good. How did that make the other person feel? Not good. So, do each of you have a father or father figure in your life? Yeah, that's a pretty good feeling. Isn't it? Well, when I became a father, something my father, re well, my dad died before my son was born, but throughout my life when my dad was alive, he always reminded me that even though I drove him bonkers and he didn't know what to do when I made certain decisions because I wasn't like him and I'm a little off filter. He, um, on a good day, he, um, he said, son, I will, I will never stop loving you. And even though I made some really crazy decisions as a kid, my dad always loved me. It's called unconditional love. You know what unconditional means? It means no matter how much you screw up, they're still going to love you. And, um, and, and, and that always stuck with me because that was one part of my dad that I always wanted to emulate or I always wanted to follow. Even though there's some parts of my dad that I really don't want to carry on, um, that was one thing about my dad that always stuck was no matter how much I drove him nuts, he always loved me. Even when my dad had to hold me accountable, I could tell it really hurt him. I still knew that he loved me. And when my son was little, it was really easy to, you know, it's easy to love the baby. I mean, you know, they, they eat, they poop, and they sleep. You know, I mean, that's kind of how they do it. They burn, they roll around. So it's kind of easy to love that. But then when you get older, you know, sometimes you make some decisions you wish you didn't make, don't you? Well, Logan's not even said really well here. <laughs> anyway. But Camden is there, you don't make mistakes, do you? No, they just kind of stare at me now, all right. <laughs> all right, so, well, I make a lot of mistakes. So, now, even though I'm a father, um, I mean, my son makes mistakes now. He's 21 years old, and um, if you see his truck driving around town, you'll, the, the mistakes will be obvious. But anyway, but that being said, but that being said, he's a good guy. And then, regardless of what he does, I will always love him. Well, guess who will always love us, regardless of what we do? Your parents, okay. You know, sadly, I don't know if you want to go across the street, the school across the street, right? You know, I've got some kids over there that don't even know who their dads are. Isn't that sad? They, they, they don't know who their father is. And the closest thing they might have to a father might be someone like Mr. Shane or maybe me or whatever. So I try to be a little extra sensitive when those kids make mistakes because they may not have been raised like you were to, to be respectful. They may not have been raised like and they didn't have a father to do that. Okay? So my encouragement to you is, you know, as you get older, and then one day, no, no tension, when you become a parent, no tension, um, that, that you will love your child unconditionally, and that you will love the people in your life unconditionally, so that they really have someone to love you. Well, well God, now, I, I, this, this might go down as the worst visual I ever brought, but this is my Bible in Jesus. And a friend of mine gave me that. I just thought that was the coolest thing to have got. Because this is on my bed, my bed, my bed post. When I get up in the morning, I usually knock everything over and all that Jesus just kind of tells me to be okay. So, um, but Jesus is my, is my father. He's like a father figure to me. And he, when I get down, when my dad died, and I didn't know what I had, and I was angry, the only thing I felt like I could do when I finally, when everything finally hit me was I, I, I literally picked up my Bible and I started reading it. And I've always enjoyed reading the Bible, and, and I only bring it up because there are so many promises that God made us in the Bible. Take a guess how many times, how many promises there are in the Bible from us, either directly or indirectly. Just give me one. Seven thousand. There are over seven thousand promises made in the Bible, either directly or indirectly. Now, the one, the, the one, there's many that mean a lot to me, but the one that means the most to me is the one that's where God says, I will, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. And forsake means abandon. You know what abandon means? 
Well, sadly, I work with some young people who people broke that promise to them. But God never did. So sometimes you may be the only thing close to God. And this is how hard it's hit lately. You may be the only thing close to God that somebody may ever experience in their life. And I truly encourage you to stay with me. I truly encourage you to let the love that you have for God, let other people see that simply by the way you live your life. And then you will fulfill a promise from God for that person. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God. thank you for the promises Yeah. <laughs> For those of you that are wondering about this uh, shirt, so my wife got me this shirt on Father's Day a few years ago, and it says, my wife says I only have two faults, I don't listen and something else. Happy <laughs> <a> Father's Day. <laughs> Today's scripture is taken from the book of uh, Romans chapter 4, verses 14 through 23? 13 to 25. The God's word so reads, For the promise to Abraham, or to his descendants, that he would be heir of the world, was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there also is no violation. For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you, in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life, to the dead, and calls into being that which does not exist. In hope against hope, he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. <clears throat> Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now, not for the sake only, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who has delivered, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our second hymn is hymn number 650, Lord, we love the humble servant. Let's stand and sing together with hymn number 650. Thank you. 
compassion, heal the sick and free the soul. Use your love, your spirit kindles, still to save and make us whole. As we worship, grant us vision to your love's revealing light. In its height and depth and greatness dawns upon our quickened sight, making known the needs and burdens your compassion bids us bear, steering us to tireless striving, your abundant life to share. I was a junior in high school. I paid $20 for a Sears clock radio, which I still use to this day. Although in recent weeks it's been failing. It read 1189 not long ago. <laughs> a little later in the day it read 1183. I think I've got a time machine on my hands and I may not get it repaired. But before that alarm went off, Sometime after I had bought that, I was awakened to beautiful music and singing from the television coming from the living room. I recognized that it was my favorite family group, the Hemphills, singing um, Christian programs that my mom would watch most every morning. So I made haste to get there to see what was going on. So as I stood there and listened and just soaked in what was being presented, I was just, it, it set the tone for me to have a spectacular day. It was wonderful just being able to just have my mind on God immediately. You know, I tried to make that a priority as much as possible, but that day it woke me up and music was in my ears, it was in my, in my head that day. Uh, the song featured their daughter Candy, and after I returned from work later that afternoon from the, uh, the Chesapeake Bay Seafood House in Manassas as a waiter, it was, I absolutely loved that job. <laughs> I wrote her a letter. And she responded back thanking me for having an interest in their music. And that letter hangs with a couple autograph pictures of my recording studio downtown, just as a way to honor some of the heroes of, of the faith and the ministry. And uh, just uh, serves as a reminder of, of God's unique way that he's, ways that he's blessed me down through the years. Stop by and take a look at it sometime. I'll be glad to show it to you. But I hope that song moves you as much as it moved me that morning. Mm -hmm. My boat of life sails on a troubled sea. Whenever there's a wind in my sail, but I have a friend who watches over me. When the breeze turns into a gale. I know the maker of the rain. I 
but it never brings me down. I know the master of the wind. I know the maker of the rain. He can calm the storm, make the sun shine the sun shine again. He is the master of the wind. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob, for that beautiful reminder that we can trust Jesus even in the midst of the storm. Will you please pray with me? God of all peoples, we gather in your presence this day, aware of the vastness of your world and the intimacy of your concern. So now we lift aloud those who are on our hearts and in our minds. Our Father in heaven, Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, Lord, hear our prayers.
departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morik. At the time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country of the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. Will you please pray? <coughs> Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. The name of our sermon today is Bit by Bit. On several of our trips out west, Shane and I have encountered some deeply rutted paths that were once wagon roads. Dirt and rocks worn away by the wheels of wagons and the hooves of animals and the feet of people making a path bit by bit. And that was how they traveled. They couldn't hop on an airplane and be on the other side of the country in a few hours. Each day involved waking up and hitting the trail again and again. And that trail was fraught with danger. Danger, danger, danger of animals, unpredictable weather, unforeseen illnesses, and native peoples all provided difficulties along the way. Each day they made their way bit by bit. Well, the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are world history. Primeval history, the account of the beginnings, long ago and far away. And then when we get to chapter 12, we are plunged abruptly and unexpectedly into the life and faith of Israel. Genesis chapters 12 through 50 contain the stories of the patriarchs and the matriarchs. And these stories mainly focus on their family lives. So our theme for the summer is family reunion, where we will be exploring some of these stories in the book of Genesis. Now, most family reunions are full of good food, funny stories, reminiscing about times gone by, but they can also be full of family drama. And so will the stories that we will be telling in the weeks ahead, full of drama. Now, it always amazes me and amuses me when people talk about family values and God's design for families found in the Bible. What they mean is two parents, 2.5 children, and a dog. However, when you dive into the stories in Genesis, these families, they're just plumb crazy and extremely dysfunctional. There is no perfect family. Have you ever heard this saying? A dysfunctional family is every family with more than one member in it. <laughs> <laughs> or, how about this one? Everyone's family is dysfunctional except mine. Well, honestly, we all have dysfunction in our families. And so do the people in Genesis that we will encounter this in the next few weeks. So what does God say about that? So we will find out together. So the entry of Abraham and Sarah into the biblical story is abrupt. They are new characters in the story. And this is a new beginning brought about by the free speech of God, calling these new partners into faith and action. 
This new history begins with Abraham's calling. We identify what is written here as salvation history because of the promises that follow his calling. We can recognize at the outset what becomes more and more clear as the story unfolds, namely that God now has set history on a course that leads to blessing. The promise is reiterated to each succeeding patriarch and matriarch. The promise goes like this. God says, I will make you a great nation. And then the promises continue saying, God saying, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And finally, the blessing ends with God including everyone by saying, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God continues this promise with each generation that follows. Abraham's response and faith will be his gift to the generations that follow. Abraham and Sarah begin a new kind of spiritual history, one in which people of faith act and trust in a promise that is spoken but not realized. A blessing promised, but not yet here. It is faith as delayed gratification. Abraham and Sarah moved by stages, bit by bit, towards the promises that God has made. But to receive this blessing, Abraham and Sarah suddenly are called by God to leave their country, their birthplace, their homeland, their father and mother's homes, and they're to travel to an unnamed land that God promises to show them. Abraham and Sarah are called to be immigrants. When Abraham gets the divine call to move, his wife, Sarai, which later becomes Sarah, goes along with him. Now, back in those days, as a senior woman, a woman of older age, with no heir, remember she has no children at this point, this journey is particularly risky for her and more dangerous for her than it was for Abraham. Because in those days, she wasn't allowed to inherit because of the laws of the day. So if something happened to Abraham, she would be left destitute or perhaps even abandoned if he were to die on the way to the promised land. And in a time when there's no electricity or a police force, one family, clan, and tribe were the main sources of protection. So being away from one's family was especially dangerous for an older woman. The history of God's chosen nation, Israel, is marked by dangerous journeys and movements, both toward and away from the land that was promised by God. Verse 9 says that they traveled on by stages. Abraham and Sarah journeyed bit by bit. Day by day, they walked miles and miles. And at night, they pitched their tents and camped each day making progress on their journey, one step at a time, one mile at a time, one day at a time, bit by bit. They traveled from north to south. They stopped in Shechem. They stopped in Bethel. They stopped in Ai. And then they traveled on in stages. Abraham and Sarah, they left everything to follow God. Imagine leaving your friends and your extended family to follow God's instructions. Imagine going up to your next door neighbor and saying, Hey, God is calling me to leave my farmland and my house and my friends and my family. I'm going somewhere far away. I don't really know where it is, but I'm going. I will never see you again, and who knows what dangers I'll face along the way, so will you please pray for me? Can you imagine someone telling you that? 
Abraham and Sarah were brave and courageous as they hit the road. They become migrants at God's request. They were displaced because of God's calling. How should we too, like Abram, who willingly heed God's call to go to a new place while also acknowledging with honesty that this call for a movement is hard and scary? How are we to be like him? Well, first, we can rely on God's steadfast love. And we can be sure that God's call is trustworthy. Secondly, following God is truly an adventure and a journey. We take each stage of faith bit by bit. Slow and steady, waking up each morning, putting on our walking shoes and hitting the road. And at night, we pitch our tents and sleep, resting in the assurance that God has us. God loves us and is trustworthy in calling us to new places and new things. Anne Lamott tells this story in her book, Operating Instructions. She once took her two-year-old son to Lake Tahoe, where they rented a condominium on the lake. One night, she put the toddler to bed in his hack and play in the pitch dark in their bedroom, and she went into the den to do some work. A few minutes later, she heard a knocking from inside the room. Knowing that he had crawled out of his hack and play, she went to get him, but at the door, she found that he had locked it. He had somehow managed to push that little button on the doorknob. After a moment, it became clear to her son that his mother could not open the door. In panic, began to set in. He began to sob. So his mother, Anne, she ran around like a crazy woman, trying everything she could to get that door open. She jiggled the lock. She tried to get it open. She called people, left phone messages, help, help. But there in that dark locked room was her terrified little two-year-old. Finally, she did the only thing that she knew to do. She slid her fingers under the door where there were just a little few, few centimeters of space. And she told her son over and over again to bend down and find her fingers. Well, somehow in that darkness, he managed to do that. So they stayed there for a really long time, connected on the floor, him holding her fingers in the dark, slowly feeling connected, feeling her love, feeling her presence, and feeling her care. In this world of displacement, grace ultimately may feel like being a two-year-old in the dark, and God is like our mother. And we are told by God to just hold on to the fingers that are underneath the door. God is there with us, even when we have no <coughs> idea what is next. Even as we journey bit by bit. So my friends, what is God calling you to these days? Is there something new that you're being called to? Or is there something that you are being called away from? Your faith journey is one day at a time, bit by bit. If you look back over your life, I am sure that you will see where God was with you traveling day by day, bit by bit, mile by mile, step by step. Abraham and Sarah's journey becomes one of faith and hope in the promises of God because they do not live to see those promises fulfilled. God's promise of a mighty nation with many descendants that will bless others was a promise that could not be fulfilled in Abraham and Sarah's lifetime. But they still went 
on their pilgrimage following the calling of God. And their journey is like our Christian journey. A journey that reaches out toward a promised future where Jesus will reign and God's kingdom comes on earth. But this promise, along with the promise of life in heaven, most certainly will not come in our lifetimes. Not that there are not signs along the way, bit by bit. Indeed, God provides blessings for the journey in an amazing range of sizes and colors. As persons of faith, we realize that hope never becomes obsolete. For according to the book of Hebrews, we have not a lasting city here, but the better country will remain stretched out before us until our dying day. So in the meantime, bit by bit, we make our way. Following the one who leads out in front of us, the one who promises to never leave us, the one who makes every mountain low and every plain, every rough place plain. The one whose love encompasses us all. The one who is trustworthy even in the midst of uncertainty. The one we can count on no matter what. So, my friends, don't be afraid to step out and follow. Don't be afraid to begin a journey to a new place and new things. Because you've got this. God's got you. Bit by bit. Amen. So in our time of hot, quiet reflection, I invite you to think about your faith journey. So spend a few moments now of silence talking to God about your own journey of faith. Gracious and loving God, be with us as we journey, bit by bit, through this life. Help us to be courageous in following you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of response is hymn number 477, We Are Called to Be God's People. Let us join our voices together and sing this song as a commitment song that we are all making to continue following Jesus. Let's stand and sing together. Take number 477.
and your grace to those out in the world. We are grateful to be here this morning in your house worshiping you. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated for just a moment for a few matters of common concern for this week. The first is that our moving forward group June meeting has been canceled. So um, it will resume again in July. So just make note of that, those of you who are part of the moving forward group. Also, we need more plastic bags. So if you have plastic bags at home, um, we're talking about like the Walmart kind, um, please bring them. We use them on Wednesday nights as we give out meals in our community. Can you just say a word about that ministry? We are continuing to see more and more folks come. I think we served 105 or so. 107 on, on Wednesday night. Um, so if you are interested, we would love to have you come and help us. Um, do that. We have all kinds of jobs we have to do. It takes a lot of people to get the food cooked and prepared and packaged and out the door. So um, we gather around 4.30 on Wednesday night. So we would love to have you come and help us. Um, and, and you don't have to have any specific skills because I sure don't. I just put food in the box. So if you want to come and help us from 4.30 till about 6 on Wednesday, we would love to have you come help us. Also, you'll notice that Vacation Bible School is right around the corner. Oh, my goodness. It's July 16th through 19th. It's going to be at Marlowe Heights for this event this year. And the theme is Pets Unleashed. It should be a lot of fun. I think on the last night, family night, all pets are really invited. But hopefully they will be on their leashes for that night. If not, it's going to be chaos. We, would, we are looking for workers for Vacation Bible School, so if you can help us, please let me know. Um, we're, we're meeting tomorrow, all the ministers again. This is a joint effort between five churches, so we'll be planning that tomorrow. And I'll be calling some of you to see if you can't help us with Vacation Bible School. It's always a lot of fun, and it's a wonderful way that we can teach children about God's love for them. Will you please stand now for the benediction? As you head out of this time of worship and into another week, bit by bit, day by day, you have the opportunity to share love with others. You have the opportunity to serve others. So go with God's blessing and God's promise of presence to love others in God's name. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.